funding for the North Carolina Institute of Political Leadership hometown debate is provided by viewers like you, with additional funding provided by North Carolina Association of Electric Cooperatives, the John William Pope Foundation, State Employees Association of North Carolina, North Carolina Association of Defense Attorneys, and North Carolina Advocates for Justice. The North Carolina Institute of Political Leadership Hometown Debate is a production of UNC-TV in association with the Institute of Political Leadership and the Wilson Chamber of Commerce. Hello, I'm Kelly McCullen of the North Carolina Channel. We are in Wilson, North Carolina at the Kennedy Theater on the campus of Barton College for a debate between the Republican and Democratic candidates for North Carolina Lieutenant Governor. The event is presented by the North Carolina Institute of Political Leadership in partnership with the Wilson Chamber of Commerce. Debating tonight will be Republican Dan Forrest and Democrat Linda Coleman. Thank you for being here, candidates. Greenville Daily Reflector editor Bobby Burns and Wilson Times editor Corey Friedman will ask the questions this evening. In time to debate, first question to Dan Forrest will be asked by Bobby Burns. Mr. Burns. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, good evening, candidates. Good evening. Mr. Forrest, HB2 has become one of the most divisive political issues in recent memory, illustrated most recently by Monday's announcement by the NCAA. How can we reconcile support for transgender people who want to use the bathroom that matches who they are on the inside with the desire of so many North Carolinians who don't want to have to share that very personal and private part of their lives. They actually said that uh, in, the, in the city of Charlotte, you have to take the signs off your bathrooms. Their ordinance went so far as striking through a provision that the Supreme Court has even upheld, saying that, uh, that the, it's okay to discriminate uh, based on sex in bathrooms and locker rooms and shower facilities. They struck through that provision, saying you had to take the signs off or it would be called sex discrimination. That is extreme. That's extreme, not just in Charlotte, that's extreme all over the country. It's one of those provisions that a lot of people don't know about. So uh, opening up the changing facilities and showers to, of women to men is a, is a dangerous thing. And so we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So when we had to pass HB2, we said, you know what? We need to tell the city of Charlotte they have to keep the signs on their bathrooms. We need to tell them at the same time, they can't tell private businesses what to do because they did that as well. But we also did one more thing that I think is equally as important is we provided a reasonable accommodation, just like the Americans with Disabilities Act that said, you don't have to make every one of your bathroom stalls handicap accessible or every one of your parking spaces handicap accessible for a small percentage of the population. We did that with HB2 and said for a small percentage of the population, one one thousandth of the population, we need to still protect the 99.99% of the women and girls who haven't had a say in this at all. And so I I think it's a very reasonable law that provided reasonable accommodation. Ms. Coleman, your answer to the same question? Yes. Uh, HB2 absolutely should be repealed. Uh, there was no reason to find a, a problem for um, a solution that did not exist or a solution to a problem that did not exist. And while Mr. Forrest says that he had call the special session for HB2 to, for the protection of women and girls, please understand that there were several bills in the General Assembly, most notably House Bill 815, which addressed sexual assault, particularly sexual assault on campuses. Uh, there was one called uh, a sexual assault for anti-sexual assault for campuses. Mr. Forrest did not do anything or speak out in favor of this, in favor of having this bill to come to the floor. The bill was never even brought out of committee. So to say that it is the protection of women and children that we have HB2, it sounds like a, an excuse to promote an agenda that is socially incorrect. The agenda had nothing to do with the General Assembly or the governor. Let's uh, make sure we all get this straight. It was Charlotte that passed an extraordinarily extreme bathroom ordinance that was against the law. It was unconstitutional, and we had to fix it. And so the hypocrisy of the NCAA or the N NBA or anybody else, PayPal, that comes out and says that uh, now they have to leave North Carolina. The law in North Carolina is the same as the law was prior to this being passed, saying that 
that you have to have your signs on bathrooms. Men use men's rooms. Girls use girls' rooms. And that's the way that it, that's the way that it is today. And that's the way that it uh, was before uh, HB2 as well. So uh, extreme overreach, and we had to fix it. HB2 has cost the state of North Carolina millions of dollars. It has already cost the city of Charlotte over a quarter of a billion dollars. The NCAA will cost even more. We don't know what the co total cost of the HB2 is going to mean for North Carolina in terms of revenue over the next several years. The cost is going to be too tremendous for the state of North Carolina to bear. It is really a hurtful policy for North Carolina. We, are, we have not only lost billions of dollars or millions of dollars, but we have lost our reputation as well. Follow-up question to Ms. Coleman. Uh, and this is a, another question on House Bill 2. Uh, Butch Bowers, an attorney representing the state of North Carolina in a federal challenge to the law brought by the U.S. Department of Justice, has acknowledged in U.S. District Court that the law has no enforcement mechanism. If HB 2 can't even be enforced and violators face no legal penalty, what is its purpose? Would you consider this a toothless law? Oh, absolutely, this is a toothless law. And it goes back to my point of it is a solution in search of a problem because there is not one documented case where we have had women in bathrooms that were uh, where men came in to assault them. So the protection of women is still yet another disguise for promoting a, a, a bill that has no place in North Carolina. In fact, what it is doing, it is making North Carolina a test laboratory for state-sponsored discrimination. We cannot afford that. North Carolina is better than that, and we need to repeal HB2. There actually have been multiple cases across the country for uh, people using restrooms for ill intent. There's lots of them. You just go out and hit Google and ask the question, and you'll see a bunch of them popping up. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, people don't think that's the case. In fact, the person that actually pushed the uh, Charlotte ordinance through the city council was a registered sex offender in, in North Carolina. So I think that uh, that speaks for itself. Uh, actually, North Carolina, the city of Charlotte, and based on the city of Charlotte, they're actually a test lab for uh, an extreme uh, social experiment by the left here, which is a, a radical sexual revolution experiment, and I don't think the people of North Carolina uh, really want to uh, want to tolerate that. But the question was about enforcement, and how do you enforce this? You enforce this just like you enforce any other law. So, uh, uh, for instance, if uh, a, uh, a man goes into a, a woman's shower, then a, if a complaint is filed, then the police follow up on that complaint, and they decide, they do an investigation, just like they do for any other law that is broken. That's the enforcement mechanism. It's the same as any other law. To say there's no enforcement mechanism for people breaking the law, of course there is. The law is the law. Police investigate after there's a complaint, and then they determine what the, what it, is it, uh, is it going to be um, a trespassing law that they, that they broke? Is it going to be an indecent exposure law that they broke? I don't know. That would be up to the police, but that's the enforcement mechanism. Next question will go from Bobby Burns to Ms. Linda Coleman. Staying with HB2. Okay. Following up on what Mr. Forrest just talked about, for a man to dress up like a woman to enter a female bathroom for the purpose of committing a sex crime has always been against the law in North Carolina and punishable by prison, permanent listing on a sex offender registry, and ostracization. Why is it necessary to ban transgender people from the bathroom of their choice uh, when all they want to do is use the facilities without being ostracized themselves? And that is my point exactly. These, the transgender people are of no harm to women going into the bathrooms. They have always used the ladies' bathrooms. Women's bathrooms have doors on the stalls, and we see transgender people coming in, and we are not afraid of them. So to say that this is something that we have to protect people, I would say that there are a lot of other 
issues that we need to consider when we think about protecting women. We have abusers and we actually have sexual predators out there who we need to be looking at and bringing them to justice instead of preying on uh, people who consider themselves transgender people and people who are not sexual predators but simply want to use the bathroom. This is not something that we should be looking at. We should not be uh, driving, it is, the, it is part of the lieutenant governor's role to bring jobs to the state of North Carolina. This bill is driving jobs away by the thousands. We are not going to have an economy that's going to work for any of us if we don't get rid of HB2 because we're not going to be able to bring businesses here. They are already saying they're not even going to put us on the list to be considered to bring conventions to North Carolina if we don't repeal HB2. The All-Star Weekend game is an example of that, and the NCAA, uh, get, we, uh, the NCAA tournament is another example. We are not going to bring jobs. We're, go we're driving jobs away. Mr. Forrest. I guess I'd answer by saying, uh, you know, how many jobs or how many basketball games are worth the protection and the life of a, a woman or a child in North Carolina from being assaulted in a shower or a locker room or a girl having to be exposed to a man in a, in a locker room at a young age or a young girl having to shower next to a man. What's the, what's the price tag we're going to put on that? An NBA game? A, a NCAA basketball game? Listen, I, I don't put a price tag on our uh, on my wife or on my daughter related to, to jobs in North Carolina. We have been creating jobs. Uh, but the question was different. You know, the, we have to look back. Charlotte create, was trying to create a solution to a problem that didn't exist. Mrs. Coleman just said that. She just said there was no problem out there before. Everything was just fine until Charlotte said take all the signs off all the bathrooms and all the locker rooms and all the shower rooms. The, we have to uphold the law in North Carolina. We, we, we swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of, of North Carolina is lieutenant governor, and that's what we did. We, we upheld the law, and uh, we made sure that our first priority was protecting uh, women and children in the state of North Carolina. As much as we have created jobs, and as great as the economy is going right now, we'll talk about that more in a minute, I'm sure, but uh, we've been doing that, and we've been doing a fine job of that, but we'll always err on the side of protecting uh, women and children. Ms. Coleman, yes. one minute rebuttal, please. Yes. Mr. Forrest just mentioned a few minutes ago that there were no cases in North Carolina, but there were cases in other states. So if there were no cases in North Carolina, why bring that issue to the General Assembly and put it into law? Elections have consequences. That was Charlotte's City Council. If the people in Charlotte felt like that, was, that law was not a good law, there was going to be an election. That was government overreach that Mr. Forrest practiced. And reaching in, overreaching into government is something that we don't need from our General Assembly or from anyone. One minute rebuttal for you, Mr. Forrest. Well, the, the city of Charlotte has absolutely no authority for public accommodation law, just like uh, the same holds true in 28 other states around the country right now that have the same law that we have. Uh, so they had no authority for public accommodation. They were told by the governor not to break the law. They were told by our attorneys not to break the law. They were told by their attorneys not to break the law. They knew this was an overreach. They knew the can of worms that this was opening up. Again, there was nobody in Raleigh who uh, was looking to deal with bathroom policy. We were working on the economy. We were creating jobs. We were creating a solid fiscal foundation. And we were working on education. Those are the things we were working on in the state. And, uh, you know, those are the two rails of, of politics that, that our opponents can't win on right now because of the record that we have. So they had to create this third rail called bathroom policy. My friends, this is ridiculous. Fourth question tonight from Corey Freeman to Dan Forrest. Mr. Forrest, you've proposed a campus free expression bill to prevent North Carolina's public colleges and universities from adopting or enforcing speech codes, which are restrictions on student expression that conflict with the First Amendment. How much do you believe college students' free speech rights are in jeopardy during today's climate of campus political correctness? 
Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, free speech is definitely uh, being attacked on college campuses. The one place in America where you, where you would truly expect, expect freedom of speech and, and freedom of expression is on college campuses, and that's the place where it's obviously being shut down the most now. So we're proposing a bill that just says, you know what, we want to protect students' uh, First Amendment. We want to protect professors' First Amendment rights of freedom of speech. We want to protect the rights of visiting speakers who are coming to a college campus to speak their mind on the college campus without being shouted down in a lecture hall, without being uh, uh, bullied from the campus. And so we're making sure that we protect free speech on college campuses, the one place where you would expect free speech to be truly free. Uh, in that bill, it still allows uh, professors to do and say whatever they want to do and say. I mean, we, we know full well that 97% of our college professors are liberal, so the liberal indoctrination is going to continue. We're not stopping that. But we're saying if you have, want to speak freely on a college campus, you should have the right to do that. You know, we, we see college campuses having free speech zones. My friends, America is a free speech zone. The First Amendment still exists in America. The freedom of speech still exists as a right in America, and it should exist on a college campus before it exists everywhere else. Ms. Coleman, two-minute answer for you. Yes, I would say that Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest believes in free speech for a select few, only for a select few. It's okay for uh, some people, but not for others. And so when you place restrictions on any group of people, you are restricting the, the free speech. Not replacing restrictions on anybody. In fact, the bill does just the opposite, allows people to speak freely. Everybody allows them to speak freely. If somebody wants to protest, they can do it just away from that place where that person is speaking and still allow the person to speak. It's amazing. It's really amazing to me that uh, people on the left are all for diversity and tolerance until somebody thinks different than they do. If they look different, that's fine. If they act different, it's fine. But when they think different, then they want to shut down their voice. This is about opening up the voices on college campuses, allowing them to speak freely. Question five will be Mr. Burns to Dan Forrest. Mr. Forrest, the state's Opportunity Scholarship Program gives tax credits to pay for private schools, including schools with religious affiliations. To what extent should the state fund religious education of its children, and what role should religion play in public education? Uh, well, let me say this. Can you imagine, <coughs> excuse me, in this day and age, being a single mom who is trying to raise kids in a school district that is failing, perhaps one that has been failing decade after decade after decade. Opportunity scholarships are just that. They're about creating opportunity for the poorest students in North Carolina. Can you imagine saying no to that mom that wants the best for their kids, just like the President of the United States wants the best for his kids? I admire that he has the opportunity to send his kids to the best university or the best school, high school in the United States of America. But you know what? We should give the same opportunity for all parents. We should open up that opportunity. There is no reason to say that only government schools are the answer for, for parents. If there's no other choice for them, why would we not give the poorest students, the poorest parents in the state of North Carolina an opportunity to take a, an opportunity scholarship, a voucher if you will, and give it to a private school that's gonna give their child an excellent education. We should demand excellent education for all of our students. And quite frankly, we really shouldn't care where it comes from. We shouldn't care whether it's coming from traditional public schools or uh, public charter schools or private schools or homeschool or anything else. We should say, you know what? Let the parent decide. The parent should have the choice for the education of their student. The government should not be the decider of that. So if you're giving an opportunity for a child to work their way out of poverty, then that's a great solution. Ms. Coleman. I believe that education really ought to be free. And I believe that people should be able to send their children to any school they want but I don't think it should be paid for with taxpayer dollars. We have a traditional public school, and if we would fund that pu traditional public school, we wouldn't have to worry so much about failing schools. Our school system has lost, public education has lost over $1 billion in the last four years. And you think that that doesn't impact it. We don't have the textbooks. We don't have the teacher assistants, the school resource offices, the nurses. So yes, we should absolutely fund public school systems. 
some of our religious schools, and one in Mecklenburg County in particular, is allowed to discriminate because they don't allow the children who are LGBT or their parents to attend that school. So for taxpayers to fund discrimination is not something that we should be doing in North Carolina. It is wrong for North Carolina. These are not North Carolina values. Mr. Forrest, rebuttal. Well, I think choice in education is a North Carolina value. It's something that parents demand, but especially parents of minority students absolutely demand it. They've seen themselves stuck in, their kids stuck in failing education systems, you know, and it has absolutely nothing to do with funding, especially on our part, since uh, we have put $2 billion more into K-12 education. I'll remind you, again, elections are about choice, as my opponent said. At the previous administration, the very year we got elected in 2010, they cut education funding in K-12 by $1.2 five billion dollars. We've put two billion dollars back into K-12 education. We spend more on K-12 education now than we have ever spent in the state of North Carolina. That's a good track record. And related to textbooks, we spend, we've tripled textbook funding during this administration. We spend 13 percent more on education now than we ever have. That's an excellent track record. It doesn't mean we're done. We've no, we haven't claimed victory yet, but that's an excellent track record. Ms. Coleman, one minute for you. Rebuttal. Yes. They will tell you that they are putting more money into education. As you can recall, the 2008 recession, everything got cut, especially government programs got cut, including education, because we were $4 billion in the hole in the state budget, and so everybody had to give up something to do that. But what he doesn't tell you is that they have not kept up with the cost of inflation in bringing back what the budget should be in this, in this day. Yes, choice is good, but again, it's not something we should have to pay for. It is not our choice to pay as taxpayers for the voucher programs for our students. The next question comes from Corey Freeman to Mrs. Coleman. Ms. Coleman, some state and local government agencies, including the town of Middlesex in nearby Nash County, are adding surcharges to public records requests that equal the hourly salary and benefits for the government employee who's compiling the records. And that's for requests that the agency considers extensive. Middlesex adds the charge for any request that takes more than 30 minutes to fulfill. Do you believe these fees are justified, and what would you do to ensure access to public records in the least expensive manner possible? You know, um, that's always been an issue in government because government employees have jobs to do, but I do believe that everyone should have the access to public records. Public, we should never shut down the access to public records. It's part of transparency, but there should be some agreement where the, there is a time frame for it when the request is made and the documents are delivered. It is unfair, I believe, for a request to be made uh, given a short time period when there may be some other priorities existing. But absolutely, in the name of transparency, I believe that documents uh, should be given. And I, I do believe that given the status of the, of the, of the local government entity uh, and their budget, uh, we could look at what kind of reasonable cost there would be to processing such a request. Uh, well, you know, we get uh, just it's kind of the nature of the the beast these days. We get uh, public information requests on a regular basis. We have a very small staff in the lieutenant governor's office, and we always try to return those requests in a matter of about a week. So, uh, turnaround time I think absolutely should be critical as well. I mean, everybody has different levels of staff, so I understand that. But uh, obviously, charging for it, we we don't do that. So, uh, I think it just uh, comes with the with the job these days. We go to Bobby Burns. Next question. And in the order word serpentine design will be to Ms. Coleman. Ms. Coleman, the North Carolina voter ID law recently thrown out in federal court ended the registration of high school students uh, to vote at school. Um, if given the opportunity, would you vote to reinstate that aspect of the law? Oh, I, I absolutely would. I think there's nothing more important than ed educating our citizenry to vote. And beginning this process in our public school system or any school system is a great start to learning all about democracy. And I believe that our children at that age will, re will have the responsibility 
and the acumen to be able to make decisions about how this country, the direction this country is going in, and to participate in that democracy. One of the things that we see now is a lack of enthusiasm for the democratic process, people not wanting to participate. So we have to encourage these uh, children at an early age to participate because this is our government and this is our voice. Our voice is our vote and it matters. And so we need to make sure that as our students matriculate through high school, that they get all of the experiences that are going to turn them into the kinds of citizens that will be participating in their democracy. Mr. Forrest. Well, uh, first, let me say that uh, I think the voter ID bill was a great bill. It was based on the best legislation from across the country and struck down by uh, a single liberal judge in Richmond, Virginia, who uh, really had more of a political agenda than anything else. But 33 states in the United States of America have voter ID. The vast majority of Americans consider that just very reasonable to be able to walk into a, a voting place and to be able to show your ID, to be able to prove your identity. So I think the bill is a good bill from, from that perspective. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, as it relates to getting people registered to vote and how that happens, uh, I, I don't really care too much. I think it's a, a matter of yes, we need to get more people registered to vote. We need to have more people participate in elections. In the city of Charlotte, when this city council won that ended up uh, passing this radical bathroom ordinance, 8% of the people who were registered to vote actually voted in that election. Uh, so yes, uh, votes, uh, elections have consequences to them, but getting having an informed electorate and starting at an early age is, uh, I think, critically important. Ms. Coleman. Yes. I want to point out one of the things that um, Lieutenant Governor Forrest says that uh, the voter ID law was struck down by a very liberal judge. Well, recently I uh, read where the news media has called Lieutenant Governor Forrest the most conservative politician in North Carolina. The voter ID was a bad, monstrous bill. It denied participation in democracy. And it showed that those who looked at the bill, who crafted the bill, did it with surgical, procedure, with per surgical precision by going in and looking at all of the uh, issues that uh, impacted people who voted, particularly people of color. And so when you look at when they vote, how they vote, where they vote, and you go in and you craft a bill to omit all of these things so that you can eliminate their voting, yes, it was one of the best decisions that has come out of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Mr. Forrest, last word on this. Uh, well, there was not surgical precision to uh, have any race-based uh, voting methodology here. Um, but let me say this, uh, you need an ID to go to the drugstore, you need an ID to rent a movie, you need an ID, as you well know, to do just about anything to participate in society. In society. I think it's shameful uh, that the Democrats in North Carolina and around the country want to disenfranchise people from actually participating in society by not having an ID. That's why the General Assembly put millions of dollars away in that bill, did marketing and PR campaigns for two years to educate people on having an ID so that they could participate in society, not just voting. And in other states where they have done this, they've actually seen minority participation go up in the election. So uh, that has been part of the process as well, and I think it should continue that way. Staying with you, Mr. Forrest, Corey Friedman has your next question. Thank you, Kelly. Mr. Forrest, North Carolina's two online charter schools received D grades overall and F grades in math under the academic report cards released two weeks ago by the State Department of Public Instruction. The company that operates one of those schools agreed in July to a $168 million settlement with the state of California for deceiving parents and altering attendance records. If virtual charter schools are an experiment in education, when are you willing to make a determination on whether or not that experiment is working? Uh, well, uh, you know, virtual charters are just another choice option out there. We created a, a pilot program for two virtual charters. That's what the legislation said. Two virtual charters to come in and allow parents an opportunity for choice. Uh, so there's a variety of reasons why a parent might choose a, an online virtual charter. It could be that their child is participating in some kind of sport that they, like swimming, that they needed that opportunity to do that. It could be that the, they are disabled in some way and they need to be taken care of in the home. There's a variety of reasons 
reasons. There's probably uh, 20 different reasons that have been stated. Uh, there's a waiting list for online virtual charters out there still, and uh, the parents and the teachers actually love it. There's a, you know, uh, have, they, have they made A grades? Well, we could kind of go through the whole list of D schools in North Carolina. I guess the question I could return to you and say, when are we willing to shut down all the D and F schools in North Carolina? How many years are we going to wait? I don't think there's an excuse to be had for any failing school in the state of North Carolina, but we have schools in our state that have been failing for decades. Uh, that's why we created the Achievement School District in North Carolina, so we could eliminate that. But we created this uh, pilot program because it's something that's innovative. It, it does work in places uh, around the country. And so uh, that example that you gave in California has absolutely nothing to do with the state of North Carolina, other than that's the company. The, the legislation said two companies. Those were the two companies that applied. Those are the two companies that became uh, online charters. And this, again, choice and opportunity and education for parents allow parents to make the decision. The government should not be the decision maker for a child's opportunity and a child's future. Ms. Coleman, two minutes to you. I would say that North Carolina cannot afford to fund four different public school systems. It is just unreasonable to think that any of these schools are going to be successful when they are all funded through taxpayer dollars. You have our traditional public schools, our charter schools, our voucher program or opportunity scholarships, and now the Achievement School District, all funded out of public dollars. And so we're siphoning off monies from the public school system. You know, when I was in the General Assembly, we had a cap on charter schools. There could only be 100 charter schools, but these charter schools were supposed to, because they didn't have, they didn't have uh, regulations or accountability, they were supposed to be, uh, have best practices. And these best practices were, be to were to be transferred to the traditional public schools. That has not happened. We've got to have, if we're going to have the charter school, we have to have some accountability and some regulations. We do not need to fund four separate public school systems and think that any of them are going to be high performing, successful schools. That is not going to happen because what all of this is leading to is privatization of our public school system. And that goes against the Constitution of North Carolina that says every child is guaranteed the right to a basic and sound education. Mr. Forrest, one minute rebuttal. Uh, public schools are, uh, or charter schools are public schools, and they're, they are very accountable. In fact, you know what happens with a charter school that fails in North Carolina. We can shut it down. Do you know what happens with a traditional public school that fails in North Carolina? You throw more money at it. That's what's been happening for decades. And do you know that uh, in charter schools in North Carolina, listen, I'm agnostic on this. I, I'm in favor of traditional public, charter, public, all of the above, but listen, Charter schools, public charter schools in North Carolina, outperform traditional public schools in every single demographic category except gifted and talented. That tells you something. That tells you that parents are making this choice. There's a lottery system. They don't get to pick their students. The parents get to choose the education. They have waiting lines for them. We lifted the cap on charters because parents asked for it. They wanted that choice in education. Ms. Coleman. I can tell you that just a few months ago, the lieutenant governor had a report pulled from the State Board of Education because it showed charter schools in a bad light, and he made them go back and rewrite the report to show a more, a more positive uh, response for charter schools. If charter schools, they are what they are, in, in the name of transparency, we should have the report given out as it was written with no edits made to it to make it appear to be something that it was not. Mr. Burns, the next question is yours to Dan Forrest. Mr. Forrest, a bipartisan group of retired judges recently participated in an experiment that many say resulted in an impartial and compact map of the state's congressional districts. What is your judgment on the results of their experiment and explain why you would or would not support establishing an independent panel? 
Well, first of all, there's no such thing as impartial. There's certainly not even an impartial judge out there, so give me a break. You know, when the Democrats were in charge, their districts looked like worms going all over the state of North Carolina. Everyone was the cra most crazy gerrymandered thing you've ever seen. When we drew the district, they're very compact, very tight, not gerrymandered at all, and we did it based on the rules of the court, believe it or not. Here's the court set. Here are the rules, and we followed the rules, and then the court comes back and says, you didn't follow the rules when they've told us that we did. So, uh, listen, that's been going on. On forever. It's unfortunate, but there is no such thing uh, as uh, somebody that's going to look at this thing and, uh, uh, and not be biased in some way with the districts. It's just impossible to do. So uh, the Democrats weren't clamoring for this when they were in charge and they gerrymandered their districts all over the state. But just because Republicans are in charge now, now all of a sudden they uh, want to have this, uh, this panel uh, make these decisions. Mrs. Coleman, two minutes. We, we need, to, the, the panel struck down the uh, districts because they were unconstitutional. They proved that they were unconstitutional. We knew when they were organized that they were unconstitutional. They did packing and stacking and everything else they could do to ensure their re-election year after year after year. And the judges are our last line of defense who will look at the issues in an impartial manner and make a decision on what is, it, what is gerrymandered and what is not and how you cross over into other counties and how you make a district so that one part of the street is uh, in one district and, and the, uh, the other side of the street is not. We need to have districts in North Carolina that represent all of the people. The districts as they are drawn now are not representative districts. They do not represent the voting populations of the state. How else could you have the total number of votes cast by one group, yet you win, you win very few? That shows you that this is not just something that is going to be uh, looked at in a fair manner uh, unless it's looked at by a, a judicial panel. And we need someone who is fair and impartial looking at that. Mr. Forrest. Well, you know, listen, again, I'll go back to the gerrymandered districts we've had in North Carolina for years under, under Democrat control. They weren't clamoring about a fair, impartial uh, judicial system to select those uh, lines. Listen, let's go draw them along counties. Let's go straight down county lines and grid the state off. And if you want to make it fair and impartial, let's just put a grid across the state and do that. You know, I mean, that's a way to take all politics out of it, take judges out of it, take everybody. Just draw a grid in the state. I'm okay with that. But you know what? That's not going to benefit the other side. They're not going to go for that either. They don't want that. They want to draw the districts. They don't want us to draw the districts. That's why that's called politics. You win on the 10th year, you get to draw the districts. That's the way it goes. Mr. Friedman, next question to Linda Coleman. Ms. Coleman, the 6th District Court of Appeals recently ruled that the Federal Communications Commission does not have the authority to allow the City of Wilson to provide its green light municipal broadband to the town of Pine Tops in Edgecombe County because of a state statute that limits Wilson service area to the Wilson County limits. Do you believe municipal broadband agencies should be able to serve communities the private sector is not reaching? How do you feel about cities and towns providing fiber optic broadband connection? I believe that it really is up to the state to put money into the budget for broadband. We have the northeast part of our state, we have the far western part of our state that does not have broadband. We, and there was not a dime in the governor's budget for broadband. And so we need to make sure that we are putting that kind of money into it so that we can provide the access uh, to the internet for education, for the children. We need to make sure that we are uh, looking at everything in a fair manner. We need to make sure that we can provide those, whether it's the city or anyone. The Internet and the information, the broadband, it is absolutely critical. That's part of the infrastructure for business. If you don't have that infrastructure, you're not going to get any business that's going to come here because that's going to be one of the requirements. So whatever we need to do, that's an issue that we need to work on. Mr. Forrest. 
I sit on the State Board of Education, and I chair the Special Committee uh, for Digital Technology in the State Board of Education, so this all falls under my purview, and it's about connectivity of the schools, and uh, I made multiple trips to Washington, D.C. to meet with the FCC and the leaders of the FCC. We met with the chairman, we met with the commissioners, and we said, you know what, Mr. Chairman, you have an opportunity for North Carolina to be a first in the nation. North Carolina will actually be the first state in the United States of America to have every single classroom connected to high-speed broadband and have one-to-one -one devices in the hands of the children. We made those trips to D.C. to convince the commissioners of that. And so we took $20 million that we already had in the state budget for broadband. We added another $12 million to that in the last session. And then we leveraged $64 million from the federal government so that we can get every single classroom, not school, my friends, every single classroom in the state of North Carolina connected to high-speed broadband. That's the first step. The first step is to get your schools and your, your county buildings, your municipal buildings connected to broadband, and then you go to the last mile after that. And now we're working on the last mile approach. And we believe that that is really the best solution is a public-private partnership where you have the, the government come in and you they help with the infrastructure and the, the infrastructure cost of laying the fiber. And then you allow, once that cost is incurred, then you allow the private industry to come in and run it. When municipal uh, uh, when municipalities have been engaged in running broadband around the country, it's been a miserable failure. What you've had is you have the cost being driven up because competition goes away. So your Verizons and Comcast of the world say, we're not going to come in and try to compete with the government who, who is not a, a good competitor. And so they don't ever come in. You want competition to come in to drive down costs ultimately. Now I can say to answer your question directly, Corey, from the beginning, if that's never going to happen and you don't see that happening, then I think the municipality should have the right to provide a service to their citizens. Mr. Burns, your next question for Ms. Linda Coleman. Ms. Coleman, uh, in your role as uh, leader of the Senate and uh, in economic development, would you advocate for changes to or elimination of the state certificate of need law, which regulates the number of certain types of health care facilities from setting up in our communities? You repeat your question. You faded out in the end. Would you advocate for changes to or elimination of the state certificate of need law? You know, um, hospitals are competing, they're very compet competitive now. And we need a, a certificate of need law to have some kind of control because in the end that's going to also control cost. Uh, the number of beds, when, let's just take for example uh, Wake County that has several hospitals in Wake County. We have Wake Med and Rex and Duke and uh, Raleigh Community and so they all will be competing for those beds. And there are only going to be uh, so, so many that are going to be certified. And to that extent, we need to control those because they're going to end up uh, looking at the cost and it's going to end up costing more to the patients who actually uh, use those beds. And so I do think that we need to make sure that we continue to have a certificate of need. Mr. Forrest. I think uh, you're never going to solve the certificate of need problem. You have big hospitals who are saying we absolutely have to have certificate of need. You have the small providers who say we can do it for less, and you're going back and forth, and this battle's been going on for decades, absolutely decades. Really what needs to happen is all the rules need to be written. You're going to have to get these folks into a room. You're going to have to sit down around the table and say, not what's best for the hospital, not just what's best for the doctor, what is best for the patient? What is best for the people of the United States of America when it comes to lowering health health care costs in America. That's what we should be focusing on. We should be focused on lower health care costs. Right now, Obamacare is a nightmare. It's been dying under its own weight. We've seen people lose their health care insurance all over the United States of America. The president said, oh, if you like your doctor, you keep them. If you like your health care insurance plan, you get to keep it. We saw that that didn't happen at all. Hundreds of thousands of people right here in North Carolina have lost their health care insurance because of Obamacare. That's shameful. Uh, I have family members who can't afford health care right now. They make too much money to go on the plan. They don't make enough money to, to uh, uh, be able to afford a Blue Cross type plan. We have insurance companies that are uh, pulling out of North Carolina because of the weight of Obamacare. They can't afford it, so that's providing less choice, driving up costs. We're seeing premiums continue to increase from places like Blue Cross Blue Shield. The system has to be reworked. Certificate of need is a small portion of that, but it needs to be reworked, and it needs to be reworked from the ground up. Ms. Coleman. Yes, yes. Uh, and to Mr. Forrest's point, the Affordable Care Act, let me just say this. 
more, more people in the state of North Carolina signed up for the Affordable Care Act than in any other southern state in the nation. That tells you something. And if we want to get more health care, we need to expand Medicaid. And we need to expand Medicaid for four reasons. Number one, there are 500,000 people who are Medicaid eligible who are going without health care. 40,000 jobs that would be in this state by the year 2020 if we would expand Medicaid. There are 600 rural hospitals in need it, it, that, that are on the brink of closure because we have, an ex, because we have not expanded Medicaid. And there, are, there is $21 billion that we're leaving on the table, almost as much as our entire state budget, which is $22 billion because we have not expanded Medicaid. Forrest, one minute rebuttal. Uh, when we took office a few years ago, Medicaid was in a $2 billion hole, and people started saying, you need to expand, you need to expand. We said, we need to fix Medicaid before we expand Medicaid. $2 billion hole, we've dug out of that $2 billion hole, now we have a $300 million surplus in Medicaid, and now we're changing the way that Medicaid is delivered in North Carolina for the first time. Uh, but if you look at the state of Ohio, the state of Ohio signed on to that plan to expand Medicaid, and you know what happened? They ran immediately in a $2.7 billion dollar deficit. They're on the way to an eight billion dollar deficit. Almost 50 percent of their budget in Ohio is going to be focused on Medicaid before long. They didn't fix it. We're fixing it. We're going to make it right so people can use Medicaid the right way. And that's the way it should be done in the state of North Carolina. And that will conclude that question and conclude the questioning phase of this lieutenant governor's debate. Let's now move to closing arguments by coin flip. Mr. Forrest, the la first of the last three-minute closing statements are all yours. Stage is yours. Uh, well, thank you. First, let me say thank you again to UNC TV, to IOPL, to the Wilson Chamber, to uh, our question askers, but specifically uh, to my opponent, Linda Coleman, for making this happen, and, and to our audience. Thank you very much for joining us and being patient with us here uh, this evening. Listen, uh, the record really speaks for itself in three very short years. Our, our opponents had uh, the state of North Carolina for 140 years. We've been there for three and a half. In that three very short years, we uh, fixed a $3 billion budget deficit. $3 billion budget deficit, we didn't raise taxes. We cut uh, the sales tax by a billion and a half dollars. We cut income tax by a billion and a half dollars, a total of four and a half billion dollars in tax cuts in three and a half years. We paid back $2.8 billion to the federal government for unemployment insurance. We put $2 billion away in unemployment insurance. We put over a billion and a half dollars away in the rainy day fund in the state of North Carolina uh, so that we don't have a problem. If the economy starts to go down, we're not going to have the same problems that we had before. We've created 300,000 new jobs in just three years alone in the state of North Carolina. We've cut the unemployment rate in half in our state. We still have a lot of work to do there, but we're creating jobs. We went from 44th in the nation in business tax climate to 15th in the nation in business tax climate, the largest one-year leap in the United States of America by the Tax Foundation's rankings. That's unbelievable record. There's no other state in the United States of America that can claim a record like North Carolina has just in the last few years, and we're just getting started. So we really need four more years to do that. And while we were doing all that, we put $2 billion more into K-12 education. We spend more on K-12 education than we ever had before. We gave teachers the largest raise in the United States of America. We've given teacher increases the last three years in a row. We increased starting teacher pay from $30,000 to $35,000 for the first time. Teachers now make over $50,000 in the state of North Carolina for the very first time. Average teacher compensation, compensation in North Carolina is $67,000 thousand five hundred dollars now we're moving in the right elect uh, right direction you know elections are about choices you can go back to the previous administration who cut teacher pay who froze the step increases who cut 4200 teachers who drove our economy into the ground who created a three billion dollar deficit that we had to dig out of or you can stick with the Republican plan that's been working and putting people back to work and creating jobs in North Carolina and improving education I want to be your lieutenant governor for, for another four years. I look, for the, uh, look forward to the opportunity of helping create an envisioned future for our state, one that protects the values of North Carolina that we all hold so dear. We look forward to growing the economy in the state of North Carolina. We look forward to creating opportunity for more people in the state of North Carolina. And with your help, we can do that. Ms. Coleman, the last closing statement. 
Thank you to UNC TV, to the Wilson Chamber, to IOPL, the other sponsors, and to the audience for waiting so patiently. Thank you. You know, you've heard from my opponent and you've heard from me, and clearly our points of view could not be more different. But we know, and you know, that my values are North Carolina's values. We believe that a strong public education system is needed, one that is guaranteed by our Constitution that says that every child deserves a sound basic education. And not only that, we know that education is what is going to give North Carolina its future. We've got to have a strong education system. This administration has been very weak on public education. We have to have a sustainable environment. We need to make sure that polluters are held accountable. We need to make sure that we have clean drinking water and other resources from the mountains to the coast. And we've got to look for clean sources of energy, renewable energy. We've got to make sure that we've got an environment that we can leave behind to our children and other generations. We believe and we value we value economic development, and we know that the middle class is the backbone of a strong economy. And so we've got to bring back those supportive policies, like the earned income tax credit that helped working families, like the child care tax credit, like the tax-free tax credit. We've got to bring back those things because the middle class is what's going to grow our economy. If we don't have a growing economy, we're going to suffer economically in North Carolina. We need to care for our neighbors, and that means the health and well-being of our neighbors. We need to expand Medicaid yesterday. We have too many people who are suffering, and we can no longer ignore the suffering of over a half million people who should be on Medicaid. We need to make sure that we've got a North Carolina that is working for everyone, that is not taking the, from the wealthy and putting the tax burden on the middle class and the working families. We need to make sure that we restructure this tax reform, which was really a tax shift because we know that we are paying the same rate. The, the people who own yachts and, and, and jets are paying the same rate as the person who owns a mobile home. Where is the fairness in that? We need a North Carolina that's working for everybody. I'm Linda Coleman. I'm asking for your vote, and I look forward to our taking our state back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, for your questions tonight and for your participation. Thank you to the audience, and thank you for watching the Institute of Political Leadership's hometown debate here in Wilson, brought to you by the Wilson Chamber of Commerce, other lieutenant governor's candidates. Thank you so much. Funding for the North Carolina Institute of Political Leadership Hometown Debate is provided by viewers like you. With additional funding provided by North Carolina Association of Electric Cooperatives, the John William Pope Foundation, State Employees Association of North Carolina, North Carolina Association of Defense Attorneys, and North Carolina Advocates for Justice.